Well, good morning. It is good to be here. A couple things I want to uh, encourage you by, and <clears throat> that is, is I appreciate last week when we weren't able to be here that uh, Rick came out early and uh, we were able to get it on the message online. So if you haven't um, been online and you can do that and we can, uh, uh, if you happen to miss or you want to catch up on something, that's a, a good way to continue on because that's what we, we did because we started a new series this at the beginning of the year and it was a series from the book of Revelation and so we, uh, we talked about uh, the first chapter that last week online so hopefully if you were able to catch that as well and today we're going to be looking at the heart of the church uh, because we want to focus on what happens when Jesus comes to church. And so last week we, we introduced the book of Revelation, and John is, is writing to a real church who faces real crisis. See, what was happening, Rome was demanding the church be uh, aligning or have allegiance, show allegiance to, to them. And some of the things that Rome was demanding uh, were things that went totally against what God would want for his people. And in chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, it, it, it's going to make it very, very clear that there is a difference between the churches who were choosing the ways in which they were to handle these challenges. You see, there were some who were sold out to Christ. And then there were others who were selling out Christ. And Jesus sends a message to these seven, seven different churches in Asia Minor and, and to these seven different churches. He talks specifically to each one of them. Now, we're just going to look at two of the churches today. We're going to look at the first church and then we're going to look at the, the last one, the seventh church there. And, and we're going to focus on those this, this morning. But those seven churches, when you think about it, were, were more than just seven. The number seven, as we learned last week, is, is about completion. It's about fulfillment. So the seven churches Jesus chose are representative of all the churches then, as well as also the churches to come. And he gave some stern warning to the people in those churches because he was concerned that they were about to lose their standing in the church. You see, when Jesus comes to church, when Jesus comes to church, he, he always looks at the heart of the church. I'm going to give you three phrases this morning that come out of the text. And the, and the first is, I think you can hang on to it, the first is, is it does not matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you are. Now that flies in the face of everything that, that we've ever heard and that society has ever told us. As far as the world's concerned, it does matter who you are. Your identity is important. Now, but some of these churches and some of their members thought that they were all that in a bag of chips. They, they were really full of themselves and they, they struggled with pride and they struggled with, with arrogance and, and when it happens that that becomes a part of our life, we don't tend to look a whole lot like Jesus, do we? And so they were very, very impressed with themselves, very into themselves. And Jesus says, it doesn't matter who you are. See, we tend to think that our identity will actually save us. It's going to help us. Maybe you heard about the college student who was a freshman and he went to freshman orientation and they have a week full of activities and at the end of the week they had this reception. And uh, he was there at this reception and there was he spent some time talking to this, this lady who was there and she was kind of engaging him in conversation and wondering how his experience had been thus far. And, and he said, oh, I love it. I, I really do. I love the classes that I've signed up for. I love the thought of those classes. I love the, the intramural sports that I'm going to participate in. I love the people in my dorm. And I, I'm having a great time. But one complaint that I have is I have, 
I have a complaint about the president. And she just like, well, what, 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 what would be wrong with the president? And, and, and she said, well, he goes, I, 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 to tell you the truth, I think he's a fuddy dud. He, he, he's a guy who's out of touch with everything that's going on. I just really don't think that he can lead this college. And the woman goes, young man, do you, do you know who I am? And he goes, no, ma'am, I, I really don't. She goes, well, I am the wife of the president of the college. And he said, well, do you know who I am? And she said, no. He said, good. And he ran away. <laughs> You know, we tend to think that our identity, or in this case, our lack of identity, will save us, that it's going to preserve us. The church of Ephesus was a strong church. It was one of Paul's longest stops. He had the deepest of relationships with the elders there at Ephesus. And it was a thriving church for many, many years when Revelation was written. And Jesus, he goes through some of those positive traits of this church there in Ephesus. If you turn to Revelation chapter 2, Jesus is going to say specifically what each of these churches needs uh, to be thinking about and what kind of adjustments they, they need to make. And in Revelation chapter uh, 2, verse 1, he said, To the angel of the church at Ephesus write. Now hold on here for a second. Every one of these letters that he's writing to these seven churches all begin with this, like this. And Jesus is going to be sending this message. And we've got red letter editions for our Bibles. And where in words in red are the words from the Lord. That's at least the words that we believe that Jesus spoke. And, and we have red letters here in chapter 2 of Revelation. And, and, you know, we haven't seen Jesus doing a whole lot of talking in the New Testament since the Gospels. But now he is speaking to John. This is face-to-face -face dictation with what John needs to put down, and this is a message that is to go out. And remember last week when John was describing all sorts of things, and when he saw Jesus, he, he fell to the ground as though he were dead. He was in awe of who Jesus is. And so he says, to the angel of the church at Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the golden lampstands. Now I want you to see and notice something here in the imagery that, that it gets stronger as each chapter goes along. In chapter one, it says that Jesus has seven stars. In chapter two, it says that he holds these seven stars in his hands. I'm amazed at that. He is in control. He holds the stars in his hands. And in chapter 1 it says, Jesus is standing in the midst of the lampstands, which represents the churches. That means he's inspecting. He's inspecting the faithfulness of the churches. He, he's measuring them for integrity. And these seven churches are representative of them all. He's saying, I'm in charge. This is my territory. It's kind of like... A, What's that uh, undercover boss show, so to speak? I mean, only Jesus isn't undercover. He's the entrepreneur. He's visiting his store, his restaurant. He's looking at his business to see whether the organization is being true to the mission. And Jesus is actively involved here, and he's saying, I am the one who's all-powerful. I am trustworthy. And he begins to address these churches. And the first church here that he writes is Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire at that time. It had a population of roughly uh, 220 plus thousand people. Quite a place. It, it's a, a world-class city in the first century. And here's some good news. It had a great church. It had an awesome church. Paul himself started this church. And then Priscilla and Aquila came along and joined the church and helped nurture the church and helped grow the church. Then Timothy, Paul's son of the faith, became one of the pastors of the church. And then John, the author of the Gospel of John, the author of the book of Revelation, John also was a pastor at this church. I mean, this is incredible. Think of the tradition that this church had. It's been said that Mary attended this church. And that follows the tradition and based on the fact that Jesus told John to look after Mary when he was hanging on the cross. 
And so if John was the pastor there, it's going to be understood then, assumed that, that Mary wasn't too far away, that she would be close by. But can you imagine this long list of patriarchs, this long list of, of matriarchs of the faith? I mean, they're all there in Ephesus. You know, can you imagine what it would be like if that church had a parroting conference? Think about it. Who's speaking? Mary, the mother of Jesus. What's the topic? How to raise a perfect son. <laughs> you know, I think I'm going to be there for that one. You know, you get the idea. This was a church with rich, 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 rich history. It, it, it should matter who they are. And this is a church that, that they're a part of, and yet Jesus specifically addresses the church at Ephesus, and he points out some of the great aspects of this ministry. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 here. Um, he says, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. And you have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. But after all of these compliments, Jesus changes gears here and he, he's very convicting and gives a line that just rocks these people to the core. He says, this is a great place, a great work ethic. You, you know, per persevered in the midst of persecution, and you don't like to deal with and have driven out false teachers. But, verse 4, I hold this against you. I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. They have forgotten their first love. In other words, you're a great church. Back in the day, a few decades ago, except one minor detail here, something's changed. You've forgotten the one who's the head of the church. Jesus said, you became a part of the church because you accepted me as Lord and Savior. But now I'm no longer the top priority in your life. You've allowed other things to crowd me out. You have forsaken your first love. You become involved in the work of the Lord that you've forgotten the work of the Lord. Jesus looks at more than the size of the sanctuary. Jesus looks more than the size of the attendance. He looks at more than the the, the the amount and the offering plate. He looks at more than how beautiful a facility may be. Jesus looks at the heart. He looks at the heart of the church, so in order to do that, he has to look at the heart of the believer. And he says, I want total commitment. I want to be number one. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine if I went up to Joanna and I said, hey, dear, I just want you to know, hon, that when it comes to women, you're in the top five. You think that'd go over well? I'd be up here with a black eye next week. Rightly so. Because when you're number three or you're number two, that just doesn't cut it in a relationship that's based totally on commitment. Jesus says in, in verse five, consider... He says, consider how far you have fallen. And if you do not repent, I will come to you and I'm going to remove your lampstand from this place. In other words, you're no longer going to be a church. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I give the right to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, what's that talking about? See, all of a sudden, I, I mean, I started understanding about how, how this was, and then, then all of a sudden, it's like, uh-oh, I, I don't know so much. I mean, he says, if you repent, then I'll give you the right to eat of the tree of life. What's this all about? Well, oftentimes, preachers, speakers, will begin a, a sermon or a message with a story. 
and then they may talk for, say, some 20 minutes, and, and then they kind of go in a let, another different direction. And then sometimes at the end, they bring it all back around together. That's called a bookend. Makes sense? Kind of obvious? Well, that's what God is doing here. Jesus is, is, is taking everyone all the way ver, to the, the very first book of the Bible. He's taking them all the way back to Genesis. Remember, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. And they were allowed to eat of any tree, any of the fruit they want, except the tree of knowledge and good and evil. But they sin, and they eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And what does God do? But God banishes them. He kicks them out of the Garden of Eden. And to make sure they don't try to sneak back in, he placed a couple guards angels with swords around them so they won't sneak in and eat of the tree of life that no one has ever eaten. Jesus now, in the last book of the Bible, brings everything back to the first book of the Bible and says, hey, I'm going to keep my word. If you repent, you'll be victorious. And guess what? You'll get to eat from the tree of life. And it's the same promise given to Adam and Eve all the way through. Jesus is saying, I keep my word. I haven't forgotten what I said thousands of years ago. I am trustworthy. It doesn't matter who you are. It does matter who I am. It matters who I am. There's a second phrase that I want us to see, and that is, is it doesn't matter what you have. You know, there are a lot of people in this world that think that everything comes down to the possessions. You know, the man with the most toys wins in the end. Well, the last church that Jesus addresses is the church at Laodicea. And it, it was a very wealthy church. It was a medically advanced city. Laodicea was the wealthiest of all of the seven churches that Jesus talked to. However, Jesus really wasn't impressed with their wealth. He wasn't impressed with their wealth at all. Five of the seven churches that Jesus talks about and talks to, he starts off by saying that they've done some good things, and then he moves on to the things that they need to work on, not Laodicea. Laodicea, he jumps right in and takes them to task. I mean, he goes straight for the juggler. And, and by way of background, it's probably helpful to understand and, and, and look historically to know that back about in the first century, about 86, there was a massive, massive earthquake. And it rocked Laodicea. And it devastated the place. I mean, it tore everything down. And they were even offered help and assistance from the Roman government. But they said, thanks, but no thanks. We all take care of it ourselves. And they told the government to keep the cash. Now, you and I couldn't imagine that. Can you imagine a tornado coming through and hitting, uh, you know, the Springfield, greater Springfield area and Governor, or President Trump uh, President, or Governor Parsons say, hey, we want to call the mayor and we have appropriate funds set up for you. We've got the money to help you out, to help you rebuild the Springfield area. And the mayor of Springfield says, nah, that's okay. We've got it. We don't need your money. Who would say that? Laodicea. That's what they did. You see, they were filthy rich. They were completely self-sufficient. They didn't need anybody. They didn't need anybody's help. And the problem is, is that mentality had creeped its way into the church. And so they didn't need anything. They didn't need God. They didn't need the Holy Spirit's help to rely on. I mean, they had wealth in Laodicea. They were the fashion capital of Asia Minor. They had technology. Now, I don't mean technology that they had computers, but back then, when you say technology, what they had was this intricate aqueduct system. Because, you see, the one thing of all the things that Laodicea had, the one thing they didn't have was adequate drinking water. They didn't have, have water. And so what they did was they, they created and developed this complicated aqueduct system with two surrounding towns. And they piped the, the cold water from Colossae in through the aqueducts, and they piped some hot water from the Areopolis, therapeutically hot water, all of which the cold water was too cold to drink and the hot water was too cold to drink. But by the time it made its way through the aqueducts and it arrived in Laodicea, the water was tepid. It was lukewarm. It was drinkable. 
and in his direct message, Jesus is going to actually talk about all the things that they take pride in. And they've got this cold water, too cold to drink. Can you imagine that? They've got this hot water, too hot to drink. And by the time that goes through all of this piping, it makes its way, it's able to be used. And they are really, really proud of it. But look what Jesus says in verse 14. These are the words of the amen, the faithful, the true, the witness, true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now that loses something in the English translation. Because what Jesus is actually saying, he says, I am about to vomit you out of my mouth. In other words, Jesus is looking at the church of Laodicea and he says, you make me sick. You're actually repulsive to me. You have no commitment. You have no passion. Try at least to fire up a relationship here instead of having this lukewarm existence. You guys are content to coast. You're going through the motions. And he's saying, I want to see change. I want something to happen. My apologies to Jeff Foxworthy. But let me help you understand this, what I'm talking about. He says, you might be a lukewarm Christian. You might be a lukewarm Christian if you come to church to network rather than to worship. There are people that do that today. You might be a, a lukewarm Christian if you act one way with your church friends and another way with your coworkers. You might be a lukewarm Christian if you are more passionate about the way you, that you dress on the outside than the condition of your heart on the inside. You might be a lukewarm Christian if you give generously or if giving generously or sharing your faith to others is something that is optional. You might be a lukewarm Christian if you think, well, the church would be better without me because I'm lukewarm and I'm hurting their reputation as a church. No, that's the wrong response. I mean, if you feel passionless, if, if you feel like you're just going through the motions, if you feel like you're just playing church, now's the time to change. Now's the time to draw close. Now's the time to make a commitment, to not give up, to step up, to, to, to not blend in. Or as Christian put on his Facebook, to take a stand and stand up. Jesus knows that, that if you have lukewarm Christians, eventually you're going to have lukewarm churches. And at once the church loses its commitment to the head of the church, then it becomes a farce to call it a church. And if that happens, we got to have it, the integrity at least to call it a club or an event, a social. But for heaven's sakes, don't call it a church. Because Jesus said, I'm going to take your lampstand away. Laodicea was wealthy. Laodicea had fashion. They loved clothing. They had, uh, had, had medical uh, supplies and stuff. I mean, they, had, they were re two renowned physicians in that area at that time who, who came up with some kind of a salve that was used on, on eyes to help visual impairments that, of that day. That's what they were known for. It's much like what we are known. We're known for our, our lakes and streams, and we're known for, you know, and we pride ourselves in, in our sports and our climate and things like that. Laodicea found great comfort in their wealth. They found great comfort in their medicine. And Jesus says in verse 17 and 18, he says, you say, I am rich. See, he's not very impressed. I, I've required wealth and, and don't need anything, but you don't realize you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from, from me gold refined in fire so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. Evidently, evidently the way the Laodicean Christians lived communicated that they were self-sufficient. That they didn't need God anymore. Church was more of a place that they just kind of went to. And material possessions began, uh, became their goal. They didn't need anything. They had their stuff. And so they certainly didn't need God. And it sounds kind of familiar to our society today, doesn't it? Sounds an awful lot like our world today. 
and the message that we are poor is, is missed. And, and so what we do, we pour into our children very early that, you know, if they want their toys and they, they want their food and they want their candy, they just throw a fit and they get it. But I want you to have a picture in mind of, of a tug of war that exists for the city of Laodicea. Because at the start, they began strong. At, at the start, they were running with Jesus and running to Jesus. And they had made no bones about it. We are all about Jesus. And then, as time went on, they kind of got attracted to the other side. And they gradually changed. They changed the direction. And they diluted their doctrine. And, and they compromised their convictions. And in a strange way, in their hearts, they mirrored their water system. And the more they traveled the streets of the city and the more they eventually became like the water, lukewarm. And instead of being lukewarm, their commitment cooled. And I'm sure, like you, we don't want that to happen to us. There's a third thing that... Uh, we need to consider, you know, it doesn't matter what you have and it doesn't matter who you are. And finally, it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter where you've been. Jesus has harsh words for both the churches at Ephesus and Laodicea. And when Jesus comes to this church, he will not stand for arrogance. I, you know what? I don't want to be part of, of, of any movement where, you know, we focus on the glory past. I want to be part of a church that has a bright future, and I want to have a, a, an alive presence. And I, I think that's descriptive of this church. Yeah, we may be older by population and age, but I think folks focus on the bright future because where is our home? Heaven is our home. We have a bright future, but we are also living in the present trying to take care of people today and let people know about Jesus Christ. I want you to notice the person who's delivering this message is none other than Jesus himself. The church at Laodicea, the church at Ephesus, they didn't have some church growth consultant come through and give them a bunch of suggestions and I think you need to do this, I think you need to do that. Jesus is talking about it. He bought the church with his own blood. He has an awful lot invested in it. And in verse 19, he says, those to whom I rebuke, I discipline, or love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am I. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they will eat with me. That's an invitation to the Lord. That's an invitation. And, and when Jesus stands at the door, he's a gentleman. He knocks. He doesn't just bold right in, on in. He knocks. And he says, I will come in and I will eat with you. And that's significance. And I don't want you to miss this. It has significance because he's inviting us into a relationship with him. Because when we eat a meal with somebody, we're saying we're in relationship. We're, we're, we're all right. There's a relationship there. And, and God, the God of the universe, is vi inviting you and I to have a relationship with him. Remember when Jesus got ripped apart by the critics of his day when they said, I can't believe he's eating with the prostitutes. I can't believe that he's eating with the tax collectors. I can't believe that he's eating with the sinners. And Jesus says, yeah, I mean, who is it that needs a doctor? It's not the person who's healthy. It's the person who's sick. That's who I'm going to spend my time with. And he says, I want to have relationship with you. I want to eat with you. I want to be in relationship. That's an invitation. Verse 21 says to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. We heard Jesus say those very words earlier in the Gospel of Matthew when he was teaching on parables, didn't he? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So the question we got to ask ourselves, are we lukewarm? Are we lukewarm? 
Have we forgotten our first love? See, we only have time today to look at these two messages from the second and the seventh churches. But if you're like me, you're really wondering and you want to think simply, what would Jesus say to Westside? What would he say to Westside? I mean, if Jesus were to send a message to us right now today, would he say anything good? Would he start off and say, you know, I, I love your commitment to excellence. I mean, I, I really love that when you, you try to do things and something for the Lord, you want to do it the right way. I, I love the way that, that you have some super servants. I love the way that you pray for one another. I love for the, the volunteers. I love the fact that you all are so sold out to missions, that you are concerned about children in need of homes. And not only children in need of homes in this land, but you're concerned about missions in other countries, that other people around the world know who Jesus is. I love that. But, and what would he say next? Here's what I want you to do for the next minute. I want to ask you to imagine you, your life, your walk with Christ, and imagine that it is a representation of the entire church. It is, if Jesus were to say to you a message of what he thinks that, that we need to do based on your own life, what would he say to you? Would he say, you know, you've forsaken your first love? Would he say, you know, you're kind of lukewarm. You've been kind of blending in and out depending on who you're with. Would he say, you need to make a commitment? Well, today's the day. Would he look at me and say, hey, Bruce, uh, I think you get a little more excited about uh, sports and politics than you do about my word. So I want us to take a minute pause and close our head, bow our, bow our heads and close our eyes. I'll say it right. And listen to what he has to say. And then I'll pray. Heavenly Father, I know silence can make us uncomfortable sometimes. <clears throat> and we don't know what you would say to our church, but I think we all have a pretty good sense of what you would say to us individually. Lord God, I pray that we would have servants' hearts to be obedient and to, to listen. And Father, to change the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I, I ask that there would be no pride or arrogance in any of our hearts. That, we, that would all be replaced with humility and integrity. And Lord, where we have forsaken our first, our first love, will you just help us to put you back on the throne of our heart, supreme? We just ask, Lord, that you would just work in our lives to help us to follow through with any commitments that we make to you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Sally's going to be coming and playing a hymn of decision for us. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. I don't know what the Lord laid on your heart in that time. But I'm sure he laid something there. And I think we all go through seasons of ups and downs. And, but now is the time to say, Lord... I really want to be on fire for you. I think our world needs a church right now to, to say, I want to be on fire. I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be tepid. So whatever commitment you need to make, maybe it's to be a part of this church body. Maybe it's to turn your life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you just need to have somebody hold you up in prayer. I'm just going to ask that you follow through with those commitments. You can meet me down front. 
But we're going to stand and we're going to sing this next this song. The Savior's waiting. And He is waiting for you and for me. Won't you stand? We are excited to be able to just share. Uh, people that have been coming to church here for several weeks. And, and Lori, if you want to just step up. And she uh, comes today because she'd like to unite her life with this fellowship. And she comes as a believer in Christ Jesus, a baptized believer in Christ Jesus, and wants to unite with this place. But it's, it's really a tremendous testimony uh, that she has. She wants to be a part of a place that's not treading water, that's moving forward, that's not being uh, tepid or lukewarm. And I, I think that's a challenge for all of us. It's a challenge for her, but it's a challenge for all of us, and it's nice to have to be held accountable that way. Where, we're, where are we going? What's God doing with us? Where is he leading us? And where he leads, that's where we want to go. So, Lori, I want to just extend to you that right hand of Christian fellowship and ask you that question that every Christian I know is, is proud to be able to say, but do you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? I do. And he's your Lord and Savior? Yes, Amen. We appreciate that com that confession of faith, and we're just so glad to be able to offer you that right hand of Christian fellowship to unite with this body. Amen. Well, this is uh, Randy, and and I always I know here on Facebook you're it's Liz, Liz but but uh, I don't know if it's Lizzie or Elizabeth. I know, but but you know, and then their their son Christian, and they come today, and I have had the privilege of being in the church with them before. And so I know where they are, and I know their heart for the Lord, and I know their love uh, for Jesus Christ and, and as uh, immersed believers in Christ, and I so appreciate that. But I just want to ask you all that, that same question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Absolutely. And we're so grateful for that confession of faith. And, and I just ask that... Uh, you know, that we would just be a blessing to you and that you can continue to just jump in and be a blessing for us here Thank at Westside. Thank you. Thank you. Have a seat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for these decisions this day. What a way to start a, uh, the first Sunday together in, in, in a new year to be able to have um, folks make that commitment. But I pray that, Father, as a, as a commitment that individuals make to the church, that we as the church make to them as individuals to help encourage and help bolster and help strengthen. And it's, a, it's that mutual growth process where we're striving to just be what you want us to be. Lord, we know times are limited in our lives, and we don't want to waste them. And I appreciate the challenge for us to, to be moving forward, to not be lukewarm, to, to not be treading water. We want, to be, we want to be doing what you want us to do. So, Father, I thank you for Lori. I thank you for Randy, Liz, and, and Christian. I thank you for their faith, and I thank you for them stepping out and uniting with this body. We just are so grateful for your love for us, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a day. And I hope and pray that you have been blessed by our time here today. Don't forget to look at the bulletin and find those, uh, those uh, announcements that are there. And also on the tables in the front and in the back as you're leaving, there is a Bible reading, a chronological Bible reading. It's not just, it's, so that is a, kind of an ordered uh, timeline. But there is a, a chronological list, and, and it's there, and you can fold that, keep that in your Bible, and you can read. You know, faith comes by hearing, and hearing of the Word of God, and it doesn't matter how long we've been saved. We, we need to be growing in the Word of God. So that's our, one of the challenges we want to have for us this day. Let's stand again as we prepare to leave and just say, Lord, we just pray your blessing will be upon you, us, as we leave this place. We just pray, Father, that you'll go with us. Help us to take the name of Jesus with us. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Have a great day. We're glad that you joined us for today's sermon. We trust that you have been blessed from this opportunity to be able to open and study God's word together. If you have any questions that you would like answered, if you would like more information about the Christian life or how to become a Christian or Westside Christian Church, you can contact us at 417-732-6082. 
or email us at minister at westsidechristian.church. Thanks again for joining us at Westside today. Westside Christian Church is a church that truly loves God, loves others, and strives to be in service to all. Have a great day.